Welcome to episode 78 of the Permaculture Pimpcast, the only pimp cast on planet Earth where we discuss permaculture, preparedness, and practical living. How you doing, son? Pretty good. How are you? I'm good, man. Y'all, this episode is brought to you by Hickory Ridge Soap from Two Old Crows Homestead.com. Turn that simp into a pimp. Bam! Okay, y'all, we're not going to play around. We're going to get straight into it. Don't forget also, you can check us out on the Fountain app where if you so desire, you can tip a pimp. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. You can definitely go do that and you can listen to all your podcasts three times the speed. All right, tip of the day, y'all. Try trading for free stuff. Now, that may not sound the way you think it does. What I mean by what I'm just suggesting there, for example... Had a girl today uh, get a hold of me, and uh, she saw me at Organic Grower School. She saw what was going on there. She was uh, very pleased with it. You know, the the reaction actually through that whole thing turned out much better than I ever thought it would. So um, she wanted to trade. She's like, okay, I have skills in certain areas in terms of like photo, you know, doing photographs and stuff like that that maybe I could trade for in exchange for what you have. And I'm like, okay, well, that brings me to another thing. Look, I was just talking to Jason from So The Land today. And folks, that's what this interview is going to be about. You want to make sure you stick around because his story is compelling. And it's almost certainly going to help a great many of you out there that are looking to make that transition from working your regular job into the space of what we all do. How cool would that be? We just put out another million people working, you know, doing their own thing on the farm. Anyway, um, believe it or not, son, if we had to sit here, and and this is what really brought me to it, how much of what we have done here was a result of trading? For example, yesterday, I I won't go through the whole, I won't go through the entire thing. You know exactly what I'm going to say. In exchange for some things that I butcher, I was able to acquire uh, Milwaukee batteries for my Milwaukee tools. Right. And those are not cheap, y'all. And in exchange for meat, good meat that you can't find in the store. I guarantee that. Yeah. Um, those wood chips, we've gone on about it. How much that honey, we don't even sell it. We either give it away or we trade with it. Right. It has been our most valuable thing. So, folks, in these times where things are tough, um, real good example. Tomorrow, your mom and I are going to head down to a place. I don't want to say what it is just yet. Uh, these people have been a little bit squirrely in the past. Um, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, we're going to go look at, um, we're going to see what's at one of the local nurseries. Okay. And I've talked to these people before about trying to do some content over there to give them a shout out. Not for any any reason or any benefit to me or anything. I've tried before and it's like there's some virtue in being intentionally poor. Yep. There I, is. I don't know what that is all about. It's yep. like there's some virtue in, in not taking a shower, and there's some virtue in being willfully stupid, following the crowd, doing what everybody else is doing. And there also seems to be some virtue in like, oh, hey, here's a great opportunity. I'm going to pass it up because I can go and tell all my friends, I can virtue signal and tell them exactly. that I'm poor. You've seen this too? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you can tell people that you passed it up because you're. it implies that you're... Sanctimonious? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like you're not concerned with with money or you're something too deep like that. To, you're too deep. Yeah, you're too yeah. deep to concern yourself with the lesser things of this world. Now, look, I am the when, least monetary you, person you're ever going to come across. You're really just worried about how much uh, work it was going to involve. Well, that was really it. There is that, and I've tried to make deals with these people before, and they're acting like they want to, but at the same time, it's like they are afraid. I'm like, you are in business. Yeah. Now, if you are doing everything ethically, I get it. Now, if you're unethical, yeah, I get that too. And you're going to suffer the consequences for good and bad. But it's like, no matter how hard I try, I can't seem to get these people to take root. Well, I'm going to give it another shot tomorrow. If not, I'll buy it. And I think they're wondering why, you know, I'm not helping them out. Well, you're not, you're not opening the door. I'm, I'm not a subtle person. So if you're not nope. getting the drift, yeah, if you're not getting the drift from me, then I'm just like, okay, I don't even know what to make of it. But look, I don't I digress a little bit. I can't even begin to tell you. The most valuable things have been the things I've traded. And this girl reaching out to me today 
um, really made a good impression upon me. It made me think, okay, okay, I understand you have limited funds. I can dig that. Yeah, I give away a lot of stuff because somebody's having a hard time. But on the same token also, I'm not going to be somebody's fool either. Yep. But you can also, when we've talked about that in the last podcast, but you would be shocked, folks, especially in these times when times are tough, how much you can trade for that really it might require a little bit of work out of you. Maybe you, you got a skill that they need, or maybe there's something they don't want to do, like uh, take out the trash, whatever the case may be. Do not overlook those things, especially at a time in America where things are only going to get more expensive. All right, straight into the farm news, son. Well, what were you doing today? Well, harvested a bunch of comfort this morning and then picked up uh, seeds and also some hay. Yeah, so some of these seeds that he picked up, um, he's picking up hay because we got the boys, the sheep, in an area where it's honestly... We're we still need carbon source on the ground. Like when you're, this is a new area that's being grazed and it hasn't been grazed since the old homesteaders left those cows there. So it's still a pretty beat up area. It doesn't get much sun. There isn't much carbon on the ground. It's kind of bare soil. We had the pigs go through first. So now we're having the sheep go through so they can poop on the carbon and create soil. Right. So we need, and also there's just not a whole lot of green in there right now. I hate doing this to the, um, to the boys. Um, I'm saying the two ramps we got out there. Um, I hate doing it to them. But I got to get this area worked over. So I went yeah. out there and I seeded this pasture mix. You saw me talk about it in probably one of the last videos. And uh, today I had William go after and get some uh, Korean Lespedeza. And hopefully I'm going to call these people and make sure because I definitely don't want the Sericea uh, variety. I want the Korean Lespedeza. Um, it's, it's basically a pretty cool legume, the Korean version of it, that you can stick in your pastures and you can provide that protein to your ruminants without the concern of bloat, which is sometimes a problem when you have, you know, when you have them eating too much of um, nitrogen, fixing. yeah, anything like that. But that's one cool thing about it. So you get all the benefits. Well, the problem is they wrote on a receipt, the kind of Lespedeza right. I don't want. <laughs> so dad's freaking out. <laughs> the The tub that it came out of said Korean Lespedeza. But the receipt says the other right. kind. And there wasn't a barcode or anything. He just typed in whatever number. Yeah, well, I'm going to call him tomorrow. And if not, he's going to be taking these seeds back, Jack, because I'm not about to put the bad stuff out here. But yeah, that's where we are right now. We're trying to bring a bunch of land into production. But the problem is the previous owners, we're still, we're over three years on this property, about what, three and... Uh, over three almost just, three and a half almost three and a half yeah and we're still playing catch up trying to remediate the junk they left behind dead trees everywhere i know it, that doesn't really show up so much in the videos but william did a really good job of working on one portion of it and you still got maybe a third of it not even yeah maybe, i mean like yeah. all those most of those the vast majority of those trees need to come down yeah so we're gonna have to we're going to turn that into a respectable silver pasture area, but it's going to require more work, which means, this, look, y'all, some of this stuff doesn't happen over, it, most of it doesn't happen overnight. No. Um, it takes while. It takes a while. We can bring it, we are fine. We have methods that bring this stuff into production much faster, much faster than you thought, but at the same time, it's not without time. That's yeah. the one thing you can't do without. And so we need to bring more of it into production. That means a lot of trees are going to have to go that should have never been up there in the first place. It is not a bad thing to cut down a tree that does not, that ultimately it's going to destroy the whole forest if you don't intervene right. in some kind of way. Plus, we can't really graze anything. It's like culling your flock. Yeah, that's exactly how you ought to look at it. Yeah, you're yeah. harvesting, culling, harvesting, you could say the same or, you know, pretty much uh, parallel to one another. Yeah. Um, all right, so I was out there making bone sauce today. I uh, had a little bit of, you know, the rain passed by a little bit. I always get nervous, man, when I'm out there doing this stuff as of late because this wood is wet sometimes, and I took some of the stuff off the porch, but there is so much of a doggone feel. I am never comfortable about a batch of bone sauce until, I, I mean, no matter how many times I make this stuff, I got to sit here and I'm... It's not excitement because you don't know what you're going to have half the time. Yeah. Because you get this thing a little bit off, then you ruin the whole thing. And I'm not about to sell it. And to get it perfect, it really you really have to watch it. So I'm going to look at what happened after all this podcast is over. All right. So, so y'all, I want to make sure that everybody knows that um, 
Keeper of the old ways. I had almost forgotten about that. That's going to be something down in Florida. That's coming up, uh, let's see here, end of next week. So just Google oh, wow. that. I Keep, didn't know it was that soon. Yeah, Keeper of the old oh, ways. Wow. That's going to be down in Florida. Your mom and I are going down there. William's going to look after things here. And uh, should be running into David the Good down there. My buddy David the Good. Awesome dude. And uh, don't forget, y'all, remember, April 15th, you're going to see the Pimp Daddy of Polyface right here in Asheville, North Carolina, at the Farm Where You Live Festival, and it is 10% off with promo code PERMA, P-E-R-M-A. Before we get into Pastor Line, I want to make sure everybody out there knows this thing is probably going to be the last appearance we're going to have this year, besides that butchery that we have coming up with Jason. Um, so we want to make sure if you're going to get out, y'all, this is going to be the time to go. Yeah. And this is the place to go to. I mean, there's like, there's, a, this isn't a place where there's things to do outside of it as well. Like if you wanted to, well, this like, is, this is the first, I mean, is, Asheville is a tourist location. Yeah. So it, and it's a beautiful place. Let's be honest, man. Yeah. There's so much, you got all natural, you know, you got so many natural wonders standing around you. There's go the down zoo. To, you well, can go yeah. downtown. Yeah, people you, watch. two people, two two legged zoo. How about that? <laughs> yeah. You got that downtown, but you know there are some bomb places to eat around here. But it's a really cool place. If you're going to take a vacation, I mean, any opportunity you have to listen to Joel Salatin, you need to take it. I hate it when they put me on the same billboard as that guy because I really have no. I am not worthy to even be on the same page. Joel is unbelievable. And I'm just glad to be able to be picking him up from the airport. How cool is that? <laughs> with that, y'all, Pastor Long. Everyone, this is Pastor Long. I'm going to share a verse of scripture with you today from Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1. It said, The wicked flee when no man pursue it, but the righteous are bold as a lion. You think about that scripture. The wicked flee when nobody's even chasing them. Why? Because they're always guilty. Because they're living an evil life, a sinful life. They're always looking over their shoulder. And they're jumpy and on edge all the time because of the wrong they're doing. But those that have been born again, that are living a righteous life, are bold as a lion. Because we have nothing to hide. And we know that we're on the winning side. And even though Satan may roar, he may growl, and he may bark, we know that because we've been washed in the blood of Jesus, that we cannot be defeated by Satan because he cannot cross the bloodline. I encourage you today, trust Jesus, stop running, and be bold as a lion in the face of the adversary. Amen to that, Pastor Lon. You know, when he said that thing about the guilt, you know, um, man, there was a thing, and of course this is back in the Oprah day, uh, where everybody was saying, every, I don't know what it was, but every girl, every woman, everybody you'd come across was, they said I'm suffering from guilt. Of course, that was one of them Oprah things. And I remember saying, yeah, it was like no matter what they were going through, somebody, everybody had to have a problem, you know. And um, I remember being, I was in college. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm an adult at the time. And this is like a little side shoot of what Pastor Lon's talking about. And I remember and this had been the 20th time I'd heard somebody say, I'm suffering. The, the, they said I'm suffering from guilt. And I remember being in this class in college. And I remember now at the time, I'm working a full-time job doing electric work. I'm going to college and I'm doing all the other stuff I typically do. And as I was going through college, I was also going through the apprenticeship. So yeah, try working that out and raising a family at the same time. So I remember saying to this girl right after she said it, I'm like, well, are you guilty? And then every last one of them, their jaw dropped. Like I'm not, <laughs> yeah, I just said it as a matter of like, she said, well, they said I'm suffering from guilt. And I said, well, are you guilty? And they all looked at me, and I remember, you are so insensitive. You're, you're insensitive. I'm like, what? I asked, are you, you said you're suffering from guilt. Well, then, if you're guilty, then maybe you ought to set things right. That did not go well. <laughs> I, that I did not go well, yeah. So I'm thinking, okay, yeah, maybe I need myself a different crowd here. All right, before we get into the good news, bad news, y'all, remember, EMP Shield... 50% off with promo code PERMA. Remember, the number one threat to your house is always going to be lightning. Always. 
EMP shit. Well, supposedly we're getting the corona mass ejection tomorrow, so yeah. you better hot shot that thing out today, <laughs> y'all. <laughs> <laughs> you should have listened to the first 77 episodes. Yeah, you're a day late and a dollar short, nephew. So, yeah, it could be a CME. Whatever the case may be, if it does fry things downstream, the EMP shield will shut it to ground. But your most important and your most threatening threat is going to be lightning every single time. Well, I don't know about these days. I mean, this thing works. It's the cat's meow. Remember, 10% off. I'm sorry, 50 bucks off with promo code PERMA. All right, bad news, good news, son. Now, this one, boy, I wish Pastor Lime was here for this one. I had to pull this one up, man, and it it's disappointing. And, the, and it's from National Geographic, believe it or not. Well, I guess it ain't hard to believe. Look here. Paganism is on the rise. No kidding. Here's where the, yeah. <laughs> no yeah. And kidding. then, of course, you got this woman dressed in this garb standing outside of Stonehenge. Of course, actually, she's deep. I'm sure she's deep. Actually, yeah. okay, the headline is saying paganism is on the rise. What if it's not actually? What if Christianity is actually on the rise, but they keep putting out articles like that to make everybody think that Christianity is lost? Well, son, based on where we live at uh, Austin in the mountains, which is what they call Asheville, <laughs> I mean, yeah. honestly, there I have come across far more unapologetic pagans than I ever have Christians around here. But you did see that kid working the bungee yes. cord thing in the middle of the mall, yes. openly reading his Bible. Yes, yes, you're absolutely correct. I have seen that, and this kid um, knocked my socks off, man. And coming across him couldn't have happened at a better time. It yeah, was a, it was I, a, I bet that's I bet that's not true. I bet Christianity is on the rise, and that paganism is actually falling off. But they, they, I, I wonder if they're like overcompensating to make everybody think that it's that it's lost. Well, all I know is, um, look, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord um, straight from Joshua. So that's how we're going to roll. But son, I mean, at, you look at everything that's going on right now. It wouldn't shock me one bit if that were the case. But like you said, we live in a we live in a world of constant lies, so yeah, it, it could very well be. I mean, uh, we'll see. But Okay, good news. Now, it's not going to seem like good news at first, but wait till you hear how I spin it. Um, <laughs> so this one's from Natural News. Not getting enough vitamin D raises your risk of developing multiple diseases. Okay, that's something that's been known for a while. So how is that good news? Now you know. It's also so, the cheapest supplement you can there take. There you go. <laughs> go out there, get yourself some sun, especially for you dark people. It requires a lot more for you. For real, I'm dead serious. For all you brothers and brothers this. Yeah, well, I guess I just made that one up. Get out there, get some get some sunlight. 38 genders now. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Oh, yeah, back to the paganism thing, right? Because that's really what it is. Anyway, um, like I said, this is necessary. This is a bad article, clearly, but it's actually a good one because, like you said, that is the one vitamin that's free. Get your butt outside. Take the kids outside. Take whatever devices they're on. Throw them away. Make them throw the ball around. Whatever the case may be, just get outside. That's vitamin D. And let's say you're in a place where it's historically cloudy. Well, I take um, liposomal vitamin C. Yeah. Or uh, vitamin D, rather. Or that vitamin D with K2. I get that from um, Health Masters. And then the other one I get from Dr. Oh, man, I could wish I could remember his name. That liposomal vitamin C. You, uh, vitamin Zelenko? D. No, it's not him. Uh, does it start with an M? Mercola. Mercola. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Mercola, he makes this liposomal, liposomal vitamin D. And that's what I take. When it's going to be cloudy, if I'm going to be outside like I spent pretty much all day uh, – Fair piece of today outside in the sun. I was planting the blueberries I got from Renewed Homestead. I was doing a bunch of things out there. So like William said, yeah, it's a bad news, but good news kind of article. All right, the other good news before we get straight into the interview with Jason. <laughs> 93-year-old man KOs two thugs, son. I wish you could have seen this video. My friend Barrett, <laughs> this 93-year-old man, former boxer, and it apparently happened in the UK somewhere. And I watch this thing. I don't typically watch videos like this much. And usually I hate it, especially. But in this case, I watched this thing at least three times. <laughs> I'm seeing this old man. He's dancing around. He's like, I'm like, okay, he's 93 years old. Boy, he's moving pretty good. And these guys are considerably bigger than he is. You got all these people standing around. I don't know what was said. I don't know what he did. But man, that old timer, <laughs> you talk about putting somebody through a five minute flurry of fist, dude. He's like, pop, 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 hit him with a 
<laughs> and then he hit this other one with a left hook and then a right hook, and then bam, he knocks one of them out cold and then goes work on the other guy. <laughs> and the both of them, this, both of these young guys, these thugs, got knocked out cold by this old man. And now that's typically, now you're thinking, okay, is that a good news story? Yes. When every other day you're see, you're hearing about the bad guys coming out on top, it's good news, especially when you got an old timer like this guy dropping manhole covers on the head of these clowns. Here's the bad news. It was my generation that got knocked out. <laughs> All right, y'all, with that, we're going to go into Jason. All right, welcome back, y'all, uh, to the Permaculture Pimp Cast. And as you can see, if you're watching on YouTube or uh, Brighteon or Rumble, you're going to see the guy next to me, and you're probably going to recognize him right off. It's Jason from So The Land. How you doing, brother? Good, man. Good to be here on the Pimp Cast. Yeah. So here he is, second time in the studio, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, second time. We weren't doing visual at that time. And as y'all can see, if you're not already subscribed to YouTube, go check us out on the permaculture pimp cast youtube channel and also break on all the other places so um yeah so i think you're my you're my first ever in studio guest and you're my second repeat guest ever nice yeah so tip that- a pimp <laughs> i've always wanted to say that sorry <laughs> no there you go man it's awesome <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, y'all, Jason, if you haven't checked him out, go check out his YouTube channel right off the bat. Where can everybody find you? Yeah, you can find us on YouTube at So The Land. Uh, also, uh, we have a website, Instagram, Facebook. I mean, we're on all the, all the platforms at So The Land. How about that? Yeah, um, Jason, folks, if you haven't checked him out, his journey is extraordinary. Came from California, settled in North Carolina at a smaller plot, and then, you know, graduated up to this new one now. And the... And the advances he's making on his property are being done, I think, in record time. Having started a number of farms from the bottom and worked my way up, bro, you really ought to take a bow because what you're doing, every time I go out there, it is distinctly changed for the better. How are you doing that? How are you making such fast progress? Yeah, it's just trying to improve 1% every single day. You know, it's tough, you know, when you're... I mean, we're a small family, me, my wife, and my, my now 11-year-old. Uh, and it's just us three basically doing it. And, you know, we're slowly bringing the fam- the rest of the family out here. And Lorraine's parents are out at, near us now, and they're helping us. And so, yeah, I mean, we're, we're loving it. Um, but today is actually the anniversary of me leaving my 9-to-5 office job. Really? Uh, seven years ago now. How about that? (laughs) Well, why don't we cover that real quick before we get into uh, some of the other stuff here? Because there, Jason, one of the biggest questions I get, and there's a lot of them out there, but one of the biggest questions I get is I'm hearing from a number of you out there that currently are in a job where they pay you enough to keep you from quitting and you do enough to keep from getting fired. And you're wondering how to make that transition from what you were doing, what Jason and I previously did for a career to what we currently do right now, which is, I think Jason would agree that it's not just one thing. You wear a lot of different hats to be able to put bread on the table, just like I do. Yeah, exactly. And that's something I did. I could not wrap my mind around in the beginning. Cause I was like, how's this work? Cause I'm used to, you know, I've worked for somebody since I've been, since I was 16 years old, you know, I've always worked for somebody collected one paycheck every mm-hmm. single Friday, it, you know, and that was it. And, and I always been told my whole life, you need one good job, you know, go to college, mm-hmm. you know, buy the house with a white picket fence, you know, get married buy buy, have two cars, you know, uh, all that stuff. And, and that's exactly what I did my whole life. And so wrapping my mind around multiple streams of income was so difficult. Cause I was like, how does that even work? What yeah. do you mean? How can I have eight jobs? <laughs> you know, like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? S- stuff like that. Uh, and so Initially, when we when I had quit, it was just like there was no plan for us. Like I couldn't figure out how because well, let's go back to how it all started. Really, for for me, um, was when I got cancer. I had turned thirty years old, and it was like, you know, what now? 
you know, and that kind of snowballed into where we're at today. And I honestly think if I had not gotten cancer, I don't think I would be right here. I wouldn't be, ta- I wouldn't have met you, Billy. <laughs> yeah. What a tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be on the pimp cast. That's too much you know? <laughs> to ask for any person, bro. <laughs> I mean, you know, it just, I don't think that would have happened because we wouldn't know that this whole other life exists would mm-hmm. exist for us. And so that from that point on, we started asking questions of like, what's healthy, what's not healthy, what we should be doing, you know, what's making me happy, what's making us happy as a family, and trying to figure that out. And so uh, I remember my last oncology appointment, I asked her like, what now? What are we supposed to be doing? You know, should I be taking vitamins? Should I be eating more healthier? And she's just like, no, just go back to how you were living. Unbelievable. You know, go back to your normal life, like, you know, you're, you're going to feel like nothing happened. And that's true. Like it, it kind of, it did feel like that, but then at the same time, we're like, man, that doesn't make sense. You know, like how can I go back? You know, it's just, it's so traumatizing to go through chemo and all that. But at the, I could look back now when I was asking her this and thought like it, back then we were almost, it's like I needed her, a doctor to tell me what to do. Mm-hmm. You know, like I was, I was asking her, what should I be doing for myself? And when she said that, then we realized, well, maybe we don't need an answer from her. Maybe we don't need that answer. We need to figure it out ourselves, try to figure that out of what makes us healthy and strong and makes us happy. And my job was not making me happy. It was eating away at me because I did the exact same thing for 17 years and, um, just our situation, you know, we we're in debt, you know, um, and that's when we fell in love with nutrition and growing our own food and trying to figure that out because, you know, we're from Los Angeles area, never grew anything in our life. Didn't know anybody who grew anything, never held a chicken, you know, like all these things. And we're just trying to figure out together, you know, as, as a married couple and as a family of what that would look like for us. And it just, you know, over this, over the course of six years, uh, from when I got, first got cancer in remission to six years, it took us that long to basically sell all of our stuff. Uh, and we had a four big four bedroom house, you know, go down to one car, and also figuring out how to grow food. You know, we started growing food in our back, little backyard, even canning. At the time, we didn't know what it, what we were doing. We were just like, oh, this is kind of fun, you know, growing that first tomato plant, you know. Uh, but now I can look back and say we're developing that homestead mindset in the city. We were homesteading in the city, basically. And we didn't know anyone else was doing that. This was pre-YouTube, right. pre-social media, right. really. You know, I think maybe Facebook was around, maybe Instagram. But, mm-hmm. like, you know, we didn't have those conne- online connections that we do now. And we were just trying to figure all that out. So a good six years it took. And finally, we were trying to live minimally also because we were thinking like, man, would it be cool to find some land somewhere to be grow some meat chickens? You know, uh, maybe grow our own meat or have a bigger garden, grow more of our food. And, and we, we fell in love with that idea. And slowly we started getting rid of things. So it took that long, which is six years, to, to do that. And finally it was like we had nothing in our house on like year five of getting rid of our stuff. I mean, I'm talking about we we're selling couches. We were selling, we we're taking stuff off our walls. Wow. Uh, one last thing we had really was only our kitchen table in our house. And we're like, okay, I think we're pretty serious about this. If we sell our kitchen table, <laughs> right. Cause we're not going to have anywhere to, to eat. And, <laughs> and that's what we did. We sold our kitchen table. And then shortly thereafter we sold our house and, we basically said, okay, we're going to, you know, it was almost felt like I was taking a step backwards. It was, it was a huge step because it was like, this is everything against everything that I was taught. You know, like you're supposed to, it wasn't, it didn't feel like progress. Right. Because we're taking a step backwards. We were selling everything. And the plan was we're going to move in with mom because mom, her whole family lived like in the neighborhood basically. And we're going to move in with my mom for a year while we go find land somewhere. We didn't know where that was. And continue to save and get out of debts. And so that was very difficult because 
I don't want to move back in with mom, no. with my wife and four year old. <laughs> right. Know? Like that just felt wrong. But, you know, the bigger picture was is that we wanted land. We wanted some kind of land, even if it was just one acre, something. But we knew also that LA area was not going to be it because I would probably need a million dollars to do that mm -hmm. if, if I found land, <laughs> which was not going to happen. Um, and so that's what we did. We took the whole year just trying to look around, and I continued to work at an office job. And my wife, she, she had already, she was in the fashion industry. She was getting tired of driving three hours in traffic to work. Every One day. way. One way. I didn't realize that, dude. That is insane. Yeah. And then home was another wow. three hours. And so she was done with that as soon as we had our daughter. And she was like, I can't do that. You know, she would never see her. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so she stayed, been, been a stay at home mom. Uh, and, but I was still at an office job and I did, could not for the life of me figure out how to get out of that office job because it was comfortable, mm -hmm. right? Like I, you know, 401k paid vacations, Christmas bonuses, oh, yeah. gas card, you know, healthcare was paid for. Yep. Like man, it was, I was good at my job. It was easy. You know, I did the same thing over and over again. So I couldn't figure that out. And so, um, you know, we, took a vacation to North Carolina to this area and fell in love with it. Cause we had heard that hey, there's a lot of people kind of doing the homestead thing out here, you know, and it was so much different than California. You know, it's very green. There wasn't a drought, you right. know, stuff like that. It wasn't deserty. And so, uh, we knew that this was the area we wanted to be in, but how do I get, how did we get here? Like, you know, I, I tried looking for other jobs before we moved, and I just cannot find it. Just, you know, I live, we live so far away on the other, other side of the country, like, you know, and so how, how, how can we make that happen? And so I thought, well, why don't I just quit? You know, I mean, that is an option. I could just quit. <laughs> and, and that's, that's what we did. Um, before we quit, though, we had we had two options here. You, you know, we had sold our house in California, made some money off of that. And I, we had like $100,000 in student loans. And we had just enough money from the sale of our house to pay off all of our student loans. And we would be 100% debt-free. Or... We could take that money and move to North Carolina and buy a piece of property. Ah, option B. <laughs> what would you do? You know, that was so difficult, right? Because everyone tells you. you read to a place the, you don't know anybody at yeah, the time. No family, no, don't, no connections, right. no anybody. And so no job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, all the books and all, all the, the gurus out there tell you pay off your debts before you do any of this kind of thing, before you start a farm, before any of that, right? But we did not do that. The momentum was there. We were on fire for, for wanting to homestead and find some land, and so that's what we did. We're like, you know what? We, I don't, I don't want to pay for our debts entirely because we would, that would be all of our money. And then we wouldn't be able to live our dream like we wanted to. We would have to probably wait another who knows long, who knows when, five, ten years to save up more money to make that kind of move. And so we ended up moving out here. We we found one and a half acres. And and then also we still didn't have enough money to buy the one and a half acres straight out. I think that's another thing that maybe people don't talk about. I mean, you see here like. A lot of people are saying like, oh, you got to buy in cash, buy land in cash, you know, debt free, which, which is cool. But for some people like us, we couldn't afford to buy the land straight out cash. Um, so we had to take out a mortgage. But then how do you do that if you have no job in the area? There you how go. How are they going to give you a yeah. mortgage, right? Yeah. So what we did before I left my job, I bought the one and a half acres as a second home. Ah, so it's too late for them to back out now. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, and then we made the move. And then, and then I quit my job. 
and then we made the move. But so, no job, no family, no connections. We have a mortgage. You know, my wife, four-year-old, we left, sold everything, left California to North Carolina to follow our dreams. And the goal was to not ever go back to a nine-to-five office job, just be together as a family, trying to figure out how to, um, uh, I guess, have her own business at home and just be healthy and happy. Been doing that ever since. Jason, that... I love your story that, in fact, the first time I ever met you, you were being interviewed in another podcast. This is years back. And I remember how compelling your story was. And, folks, here's how, here's how these things happen. So I heard Jason on this other podcast, and the name of it escapes me now. In fact, I don't even think they podcast anymore. So I go and check out his YouTube channel, and I'm thinking, okay, I like this cat. And then I went on to find out, oh, I, I went back and watched his videos and said, okay, He's in this place of North Carolina where when I was in the army, I used to go all the time, go climbing and stuff like that. So I'm like, okay, well, man, it seems like a whole lot of homesteaders are out there. What's up with that? I knew the hollers were out here by that, or or at least we're thinking about it. So I wrote to Jason and uh, asked him if he would, you know, I paid him for a consultation. And to my knowledge, I was your very first consultation. Yeah, yeah, because even people at that time... We were just kind of starting our YouTube channel. I so. think you may have had maybe 40, 30,000, something like that, yeah. subscribers at the time. And then so Billy was like the first person to be like, hey, I want to call you on the, f- I want to talk to you on the phone. Yeah. I'll pay you. Yeah. Usually people have all these questions and they're like, they don't, they don't put skin in the game. Well, that's exactly, right? <laughs> that's exactly why I knew I'd go to the front of the line because, you know, as a businessman and I've been in some way or another an entrepreneur my whole life. Um, I knew that if I could get you on the phone and pay you for your time instead of, um, and there's nothing wrong with asking emails or something like that. I know that I could go directly to the front of the line if I could just say, Hey man, I will pay you for your time. And you did it and you answered my call. And I'll never forget that call. I was in a fifth wheel on the job in Sherman, Texas, talking to you. It was a hundred freaking degrees out, out there in (laughs) Texas. And it was about as hot inside that fifth wheel. And it was my fifth wheel. I was literally living on the job at that time. Michelle had already gotten out. We we basically did ours a little bit differently. We got Michelle out of the matrix first in terms of a job. Then we got William out. And then, of course, I was going to pick up the rear because I make the most money. So that's what the plan was. And I remember talking to you on the phone. William had just been arrested in Texas for having a dirty license plate, no. quite literally. For a dirt, it wasn't, hey, he's carrying, you know, he's a drug mule or nothing like that. He had a dirty license plate. At that point, we decided we were moving. So I got with you. You got with me. We ended up talking on the phone. And I remember by the time I got done with that phone call, I was already I was already convinced I was moving before the phone call was done. And Michelle and William had already made up their minds before I even made the call. <laughs> it was just a matter of where we were going to go. I should have been a realtor. I'm telling you, well, you did turn me on to a realtor as well. Yeah, yeah. You're like, hey, dude, are you coming back, coming out? Or, you know, if you are, I got some, these realtors. They were so busy at the time, they couldn't get me in, so I had to go with somebody else. Right. Literally came out here, in a lot of ways like you, I didn't have, I still had a job at the time. It's funny, because we did almost the same exact thing. I, yeah. <laughs> I'd already owned my land back in Texas, so I didn't have a mortgage, and we were living on it and building it from the ground up. But we had essentially did the same thing. But folks, what I'm trying to communicate here is that it all started for me, at least moving to this area, it all started by hearing Jason's story and it was so compelling. So all of you folks out there that are hitting me up with the emails, I think that's wonderful. But I really, I'm so glad to have Jason in the studio to basically give you his version of how he did it. Frankly, I haven't really gone much into the story about how we did it and maybe I'll cover that in future podcasts. But from that point, y'all, he's an extraordinary man, a good friend of mine. As soon as we got out here, kind of took me under his wing because we didn't know anybody either. And said, hey, you want to go to church with me? I guess he thought he ought to chase the demons up out of me or whatever the case was. I was like, Billy, I think he needs to go to church. Yeah, man. He's like, let's bring this cat to church. So we ended up going to church together. And then he raises up, moves out of here, moves to the new property. And um, we're still friends. And we we try to link up as often as possible. Yeah, we're not that far away. No, we're, I mean, for me, okay, so... 
you know, Lorraine drove what three hours one way for me in Texas. It was two and a half hours one way. I wasn't making that job every day. I yeah. basically lived on the job in my fifth wheel, literally on the job. They let me live there. And, um, so we live about an hour and a half away about from one another. So, you know, I go down there, help Jason with things. He comes up here and helps me. But all you folks out there that are thinking, how do I make that transition? You just heard from the horse's mouth. One way he's done it. We'll talk about mine in the future, but Along the way, Jason, doing this thing, man, you've done just about every, you're a, you are a very brave man, although he's, he'll never tell you this, y'all. He's intrepid. He's brave to do what he did and to do what a lot of other people in this space do, where you leave everything, you know, pack up, go somewhere else, begin a new life and be a success at it is very brave because most people just don't have it in them to do. But right now with times being what they are, a lot of people are. So Jason, you're here. And, um, tell everybody about how you were hustling and, you know, the yeah. things you had to do to kind of, you know, put bread on the table at first. Yeah. I mean, my background is computer drafting. So I did a lot of kind of architectural, uh, computer drawings, uh, for people when I, that's when I was in my office job. So I knew that, Hey, that's something I could fall back on or maybe just do in North Carolina. So I figured to be honest, I was like, you know what, is this really going to work? Like, what are we going to do? Like, how am I going to make, like the reality is you got to make money you got to do something. You got to pay the bills, whether it's little bills or, or whatever, like you got to make some kind of money to put food on the table. And so I've just figured I'd be at, at an off, another office job. I was like, I could always work in an office, you know, but in North Carolina. And that's what I did. We had, when we moved out, we had six months worth of savings mm -hmm. from the sale of our house. And we're like, if I absolutely had to not work for six months, we'd be okay. And so after three months of not collecting a single paycheck, you kind of freak out. <laughs> you know, I was like, I'm, I'm used to collecting that paycheck every Friday. I was like, okay, the first month is like, man, I haven't got paid at all. Like, this is weird. Yeah. It's so weird. Like, I was scared to death. Like, I was scared to death. I was trying not to freak out. Like, I honestly, like, I had, like, mentally, like, thoughts in my head of, like, like a little voice in my head telling me, you can't do this. Like, this is not going to work, mm. you know? And, and I really thought that that was doubt and fear just getting into my brain and like, don't do this. You, it's not going to work. You know, go, go back, go back to California. You can't do this. And so just by just slowly, just figuring things out, like it came, it came down to like, what am I, what am I willing to do? Am I willing to go deliver pizzas? If I, am I willing to go be a bartender, you know, like, uh, you know, clean somebody's house? Like, what am I willing to do to make this lifestyle work? And so that's what I was just open minded to whatever I can do. And that was trying to make first thing I, we wanted to do was get connected to a good community, you know, get to connect to good folks. We got connected to a church right away, met people through there. Um, just homesteading community also out here is great. I mean, we went, the first thing we went to is, and hung out at is farmer's markets. Cause we thought, well, those are, those are our people, right? Like these people are growing food. We want to grow food. Let's, let's try to be friends. And so meeting people through there and just potlucks and just putting the word out like, Hey, I'm looking for work. Like, is anyone, you need something at your house done? You need something cleaned up? You need something installed. Like I didn't have a background in woodworking or handyman stuff. I just was willing to, to work. Like I was willing to figure it out. And so that's what I like, just early on. It was just a lot of handyman stuff that mm -hmm. I was doing. And then, um, the first job after about three months, I was like, I gotta, I gotta find, I gotta get some kind of paycheck here. I gotta have something coming in. So I was an Uber driver for, in downtown Asheville for a couple months and that's great if you ever lit, go to a new area be an uber driver yeah you'll learn the area <laughs> yeah <laughs> and the people that are here yeah it, it's, it was quite fun actually it was entertaining <laughs> but um you know did that i worked for a furniture company for a little bit you know just kind of doing deliveries it was really just doing whatever i can to pay something some kind of bills and we're you know we're living pretty frugally i mean we had sold a lot of our stuff. So like for the first entire year of living out here, 
we're we're sleeping on a blow up mattress. Like yep, we, cause we, there. Could, we couldn't afford yeah. like a real mattress. And even then my mom saw we're sleeping on a, a mattress like that. She goes, I'm going to buy you a mattress, you know? <laughs> so she bought us our first mattress out here. Um, so, you know, we're just trying to do whatever I can. I mean, and then like, you know, I, I got connected with a friend of mine that I met and that was converting school buses into tiny homes. And I, I, I loved doing working with my hands and doing woodworking. I was doing some, I was doing some of that working part time and all these things were just part time work. It, nothing was full time and it was all seasonal. And it was hard to wrap my mind around that because I was coming from a background of one good job. And here I was just doing all these little things at the same time, trying to build a YouTube channel uh, early on. And then, um, uh, you know, we're still trying to figure out how to grow in this environment. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we moved into a one and a half acres, a single wide mobile that was run down, trying to fix that up. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, just making connections, uh, trying to do whatever we can to make it work while, while continuing to figure that out. And then this area is like great for uh, crafts like uh, woodworking, pottery, which we did not know that about this area. Um, it was just. I mean, that's the stuff that we like, 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 um, artists, art, artistry and stuff like that. And so I did a lot of craft shows early on. That was great. I mean, I would just do home goods, like woodworking type stuff. And I was, so all the, all these things that just handyman work, woodworking and trying to build up our, our online presence and YouTube channel, slowly making it work. And it probably took a good, I would say three or four years of doing all those things and growing this YouTube channel where finally the YouTube channel kind of took off almost. It it grew after three or four years where all these other things that I was doing, handyman stuff, I, I started to say no to because I really fell in love with the uh, creating the videos on our YouTube channel and that was taking off. And and look And look at where it led. I mean, in so many different ways. So it has a bunch of different... Tentacles. Jason along the way has learned so many. I know because I watch your YouTube channel, maybe not so much as of late, just because I've been so doggone busy. But I'm I'm seeing your growth from where you started into where you are now, which brings me to the next point where bro, you're out here butchering cows last time I saw. I was yeah, looking man. at you. So you started off doing chickens, and then of course we're doing pigs. We did it together. And then of course, um cows. And so now coming up real soon, we're going to have a butchery class where we're going to be, well, it's going to be hosted at your place and you and I are going to be teaching together down there. Um, let's talk about that for a moment. Um, Jason, some people might be concerned about the price. Now I want to be perfectly clear because I had to explain it in the last podcast that you get more for this butchery class than you will any other butchery class on planet earth, folks. That's coming from me. Now included, why don't you tell everybody what the dates are and what they include in here? Because this is profound, y'all. Yeah, the dates are, we have uh, two separate classes and they're both two day events. So April 28th, 29th, and then the next, the following weekend, which is May 5th and 6th. And then one day is we're going to be scalding, showing you how to scald a pig. And then the next, and then the following uh, end, we're going to show you how to um, skin a pig. Mm -hmm. So you could choose, do you want to learn how to skin or scald? I feel like there's not too many people teaching you how to skin a pig. So that might be a good option for folks. That's why we wanted to provide that. And, and then, you know, me and Billy, you know, Billy's great. I mean, when I first talked to him on that consultation, I was like, man, you know, it sounds like he knows his stuff back then, even though I didn't meet him. And then after meeting him and then seeing his YouTube channel, you know, for the first time I was like, okay, I mean, these, I mean, his whole family is great and, and knows his stuff. And so I thought, well, let's collaborate in some way. And, and for me, like, too, like, I, I know how to do this stuff, but I feel like if I could collaborate with somebody else, like a friend of mine or somebody that I know that I trust, that's just going to make, I think, e that's going to grow each other. Yeah, it I does. I feel like it's it like we're creating this, I guess, community of, like, I'm supporting him, he's supporting us. 
like you know why not and you learn it even better when you when you teach it right. that's really that's that's um that's profound jason in this course coming up in these two courses like jason said we're going to be scalding a pig and we're going to be um, skinning one. And part of the idea of with the skinning is that it applies no matter the animal. And trust me, if you can skin a pig, there is, you could skin a dog on you name. All right. Sorry about the technical glitch there. Y'all that's me. Um, so anyway, in addition to this class, y'all, instead of getting the regular two day butchery class that you're going to get, which is going to be very, it's going to be quite comprehensive. In addition to that, you're also getting the electronic version and the PDF that goes along with it. The recipes, Jason, why don't you tell them what they get for their money? Because not only the cost of the course would be worth it if it was just the two days, but you've added in some serious value. You want to tell them what they get with all that? Yeah, well, me and Bailey created an online course, which includes like, this is all original content, like original videos. I think there's like 10, 12 different videos that, and it's like lifetime access to this course that you have, plus a step-by-step -step color guide that we've created and this stuff you could just take home. I mean, you know, there's one thing that's seen all this stuff on, on videos and, and going to, or, or going to the class and seeing that. But honestly, when you t go to this type of classes, these hands-on workshop type things, uh, you're going to forget it when you go home. Yeah. To be honest. Yep. Like, especially if you've never seen anything like this before, like you're going to go home and be like, uh, what did he say? Like, I don't remember that, but you could go home and you're going to basically take the class with you when you go home and you're going to have all the videos. You're going to have the step-by-step -step color guides and you'll have that for the rest of your life. And, and so when you're going through the color, say the color guide or the videos, you'll remember what Billy said in the actual class too. Like, okay, what do you say here? Oh, let me go through this. Right. It's almost a paint by numbers yeah. the way we do it. The way you're going to learn this, folks, it is going to be a paint by numbers, but that is the problem. Usually the golden rule in butchery is that, and it depends on whom you hear it from, it takes about 30 pigs for you to be pretty doggone proficient at it, okay? But like Jason said, it's like you can watch that video as many times as you need. Oh, shoot, how did he separate the Boston butt from the picnic ham? I can go to that part in the video, go look at it in high detail, Go look at it in your color guide and be able to make those references immediately. So this is, in my judgment as a butcher, this is by far the best way to do that. So that's why the cost is what it is, y'all, because you're getting a lot more value. Like I said, if we didn't add anything else, it was already worth it. With this on there, this is really the icing on the cake. So like Jason said, you take it away with you. Well, plus, I mean... The goal here, the ultimate long-term goal is that you're going to go to this class. We're going to share our knowledge with you. You're going to go home. You're going to teach your family how to butcher a pig or your friends or and your community. teach your own classes, yeah. And you're going to teach your own classes. You're right. Gonna, and that's, gonna, that's like the snowball effect, right? Like you're going to teach right. somebody. They're going to teach somebody. They're going to teach somebody. And more and more people are going to know this knowledge all from you just going to this class. Absolutely. So you could absolutely, in in terms of what Jason was talking about, let's say you're looking to make this jump to the lifestyle. There may be people out there, and I know there are, that absolutely have a passion for this. Well, guess what? You're jumping into this new lifestyle and you're wondering how you're going to make a living at it. Well, maybe butchery is one part of it because there is a big time shortage of people that can process right now. You can charge money for your own classes. Um, the, the sky's the limit. So if you're looking to make this transition, and I know so many of you are, because I read every single email that comes through here, and I'm sure Jason gets a lot of these also. Folks, you just heard it chapter and verse, how, did, how he did it, and in the future, maybe you'll hear how I did it. But if you're wanting to get more empowered, especially in this day where inflation is going through the roof, you've already heard what's happening right now in the financial system. They're going to inflate it even more, meaning your dollars are going to be worth less. And you probably want to know some of what we know. For example, how I raise my sheep for free, how we raise our cow or pigs, better, better yet, for 21 cents a pound, how we raise our chickens for free and produce a cubic yard of compost a week at the same time doing it, how to raise all of our eggs for free or with very little input costs. All these things at the end of the day don't mean anything if you don't know how to process that animal. So whether Jason has a chicken butchering class 
and you can go see that at his website. And also at his website is our joint venture of this pig processing, which is fantastic. But honestly, you want to get there, get boots on the ground, and see this three-dimensionally, see how it can be done. Um, yeah, plus, but, plus it's at our homestead, so it's like it's, oh, at a, yeah. it's at a real homestead, right? Like we're not – it's not at a big event center. That's right. Where you're just sitting on a chair and you're watching somebody – butcher a pig like you're, or, you're there in real life like that's a, that's a very good point jason because a lot of time at those event centers you're never going to see anybody dispatch the pig that's true yeah. you're never ever ever unless it's on the homestead you're never going to see that from start to finish a lot of people will come in because i've done a lot of these demonstrations where they'll come in with half a hog and they're breaking it down well what good is that if you didn't know how to get the? You don't know how to get it to a half the, the important part yeah <laughs> if you don't dispatch that animal okay he had you had to take you had to take life in order to get to that point. Yeah. So you're going to learn every step of the way. Just a regular butchery class is charging about what we're charging right now, and you don't even see that part. You don't even learn that part. So this is going to be. Um, we're looking forward to everybody being out there. You're going to learn a ton. You're going to fellowship with a lot of awesome people. You can hang with the pimp. That's right. And of course, <laughs> Jason. He, he's a he's a pimp himself. Permaculture is his passion as well. <laughs> Bro, thank you so much for being in the high top Billy's Jungle Palace of Love here in the Pimpcast Studio. Yeah, man, thanks for having me. This is this was awesome. Thank uh, you. All right, well, thanks. <laughs> hey, y'all, stay tuned. Um, we're gonna do a little video with Jason outside. We're gonna get a few other things done. All right, y'all, back to it. No bueno, I answered and no one start calling me NATO. Digital cheese on the way though. Get you a bowl of alfredo. It's a woke summer. I need another booster before I hit the beach. Be a song cracks me up every single time, <laughs> y'all. <laughs> Especially if you guys see the album art. <laughs> All right, y'all. Ten percent off at our new sponsor, Heaven's Harvest. Um, you may have what you need out there. You know, your beans and rice and all that stuff. If you want to put back meat, you want some seeds. And which, by the way, we're going to be testing out their seeds. I haven't endorsed them yet because we haven't yet tried them. But I hear they're really good. I'm not taking anybody's word for anything these days. I know the food's good. And um, I think you ought to check them out. So 10% off with promo code PERMA. Go check them out as well. And don't forget Harvest Right Freeze Dryers. All right. From the Fountain app, we got Strider 47. And he's saying, William once said he thought everyone in town was an NPC. Now, Billy is saying all the old white dudes are cookie cut. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, yeah. I, honestly, right here in Ash, y'all come here to this festival and we will go people watching if we get the chance. Yeah. You won't like, you're going to, you'll agree. You're going to agree that every retired white guy, I, I know, well, that's a stereotype. And you'll see yeah, the contrast. And you'll see the contrast yes. between. Well, first of all, there aren't any old black guys or Asian guys or anything like that in Asia, Nashville. No. But you'll see the contrast between the people at the festival. There you go. Because everybody's going to be cool there, and then the people in Asheville, where yeah. everybody might or may or not be human. I don't you, know. Yeah, you just go there, and you will find out, man. I guess I don't know if we're turning people on to actually go to this thing. Uh, it's interesting. Yeah, you're going to meet some interest. The, the mountains are pretty, too. The mountains, I mean, th we do live in what I think is paradise. And it's not going to be for everybody, but it is to me. And uh, even if I got to, you know, put up to a certain extent with some, you know, Get nut shoulder jobs check by here. Marchies. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, Martha, uh, she sends me a scripture, Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Well, if we're wondering what the uh, prescription is to set things back on its track, that's it. Yeah. There you go right sure. there. I got another one from Strider47. They're all drones that can get by in lesser quality food. Best grow your own. Hashtag tip a pimp. Hashtag catch a jack. Hashtag pluck around and find out. <laughs> Bam! I love Strider, yeah. man. All right, so from Zach here, truth be told, he's sending these pictures of these chemtrails. Oh, good night. He says, have you ever noticed that crows around the jungle palace of love making extra ruckus when these planes are flying over? Is it something I've noticed? Or, well, you know, I, I've never I paid attention. Know. I've never. To, usually it's chickens making ruckus all the time. Yeah. So you kind of zone out on that, but we'll have to pay attention. That's a good, that's something interesting. That would be quite out. the barometer, man. Those are very intuitive birds. I got another one from uh, Dan Del Coyo. 
Uh, great interview. I love the episodes of TSP with the chef Keith Snow on them. I hope you have a future collab with him. I also did not realize he had his own podcast. Now I have an extra show to binge between episodes of the Pimp Cast. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you what. Chef Snow, man, when I heard his uh, podcast, I'm like, okay, I'm definitely in good company here. Yeah, his website, his... um. Like his freeze dried food kits, they don't look like that. They look like uh, like you're signing up for some meal plan. They look like off the hook. Well, he you said, you know me, what I mean. I, they I don't would look love like to, you're uh, preparing for the apocalypse. Well, I want to check about. I want to check out his recipes and stuff. Haven't had a chance to do it. He's been emailing me, and you know, I, I need to respond to him. I I'm just up to my eyeballs with so many different things. But yeah, um, had a lot of good response from Chef Snow and also with the boys I've had on. Yeah. Uh, B&B Machine, man, I'm telling you what, they hit it out of the park. Folks, if you got young people, have them listen to that and maybe it might give them a little bit of encouragement as far as what they intend to do with their lives. Uh, Ryan, do you clip your chicken's wings? If so, how young do you clip them? God bless you and yours. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, we do. Um, we start clipping them when they start jumping out, I guess. And that's our barometer for every time we clip. Yeah. We just clip every time they start jumping out. Um, and then, you know, to clip to the secondary wings, flight wings and stuff like that. So. Yeah, so, and then now we, we got to get another fence because it's not tight enough. And they've been, those black ones, the Australorp-looking ones. I say Australorp-looking because... Who even knows at yeah, this point? Yeah, I mean, we've... we've you know, we're not exactly getting them off the shelf at Tractor Supply. <laughs> uh, Elisha Johnson, a uh, great bonus episode with a young machinist. I have a master's in business, a bachelor's in organizational leadership, and Air Force education. Other oh, some aspects of the Air Force ed- other than some aspects of the Air Force education, it was all crap. I'm right there with you, buddy. Uh, living where I now live, I learned more in a half hour conversation with non with local non degree holding business owners than I did in formal education. Yeah. I can't, I can't agree more. Um, yep. That's what Andy Frisella talks about all the time. Um, the people that are teaching at those business schools are the ones that can never do it. Or the guy the guy that had me cracking up is one of the local, I won't say who or what, but the guy, he's doing a podcast, and he's in here with this business coaching, and he has no business. Yeah, He's working as an employee somewhere else, and he's doing business coaching, trying to tell me how to do certain things on how we do business. And I didn't find out till later. I, I just listened, but and then find out later. Not only does he not have a business, he's working for somebody else. So be real mindful where, like my grandma always used to say, be mindful where you get your advice or who you tell your advice because the wise don't need it and the fools don't heed it. All right, got one from Alan. He said, Billy, listen to Monday's podcast at the gym. Y'all had me laughing so much I almost dropped. <laughs> yeah, so I'm I'm glad that helped out. Um, we always try to you know add a little bit of levity, and that's one of the things that a lot of the podcasts out there in the farm realm just don't do. Yeah, um, it's not. I'm not I'm not dogging any of these people, but it's usually okay. So what you're normally going to find is going to be a guitar, acoustic guitar intro. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's going to be that. And there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's like you know what. I was born original, and I'm not going to be a copy. I don't care what everybody else does. If I want to play the Gap Band, I'm going to play the Gap Band. This is the Pimp Cast. Bam. So, yeah, we're going to – we can fuse the farming along with it, I think so. Um, okay, uh, from Chaz here. Hey there, Chaz. I mentioned uh, – I heard you mention using swales on your property soon. I live in western North Carolina on the border – Blah, 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 blah. I was under the impression that swales were for drier climates to hold more water in the landscape. So what's the point? With us being in a temperate rainforest, just some random thoughts. Uh, could it be detrimental during wet seri- uh, wet seasons? Uh, no, it's only a benefit because even like temperate rainforests have their dry seasons. And even us go, th- like we still go through drought periods and stuff like that. And it just does better. Like your pasture is still better. Like in a, we're in a subtropical rainforest at uh, Jeff Lawton's place. And his whole farm has swales. Here's another thing to consider also. It's also not just capturing that water. It's also directing that water where we want it to go. Exactly. So there, we plan on having ponds out here as well. So it's not just, I mean, there's certain parts on this property you cannot put a swale. I mean, if you're, you, you've got a terrace or you're not doing anything, it's that steep. 
But in the areas where we can, we can use it to channel and funnel that water in the places where we need it. And that's really what we're doing with it. How much, I wonder how much crap Chaz got whenever the Antifa did that city in Seattle. Oh, man. I was, <laughs> I, I didn't want to say it out loud. Man. Yeah. You probably got dealt with, my man. So best of luck there. Um, well, let's see here. I heard you mention in one of your videos about feeding chickens. Hey, y'all, this font, you got to look. I'm a little older, y'all. Let me read it. I think I can make it out. I met, I heard you mention in one of your videos about feeding chickens, a deer repellent you make. Uh, would you be able to provide me a link or how you make or sell it? Okay. Um, no, we're not feeding chickens no. bone sauce. I can promise you that. We feed them bones. We feed them. Yeah. Well, they get bones as a, you know, yeah. uh, from other animals and they will sometimes pluck the marrow out of it. If I'm not using it for bone sauce. No. Well, you're talking about for the deer repellent. And we have a lot of questions about that as of late. A lot it's of people spring. wondering. Everybody's thinking about growing and stuff. Yeah. And it honestly, it was meant for orchards and food forest kind of settings. A lot of people have had great success using it in the garden. But that's what it was for. I mean, I stand behind it because I know what it does. And I know how well it worked for us. We wouldn't have an orchard if it wasn't for bone sauce. So exactly. I'm thankful. And, of course, we've made it much, much stronger. Basically, it's heat, water. Um, it's heat, water, time, and technique. That's really what it is to make it. There's a technique to it, and that's the only thing about it that's proprietary. There's nothing in it that's going to kill you. I wouldn't eat it and definitely don't put it in there, you know, don't put it out at the barbecue. I can tell you that. Yeah. People are going to eat this stuff and think, what on earth yeah. did you just do to me? Don't but eat yeah. it because it's disgusting. Not that it's going to kill you. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's non-toxic. You can stick it on your plants. Just make sure you don't put it on the green areas. And like I said, man, everybody and the great grandmother hitting me up about this. Uh, the stuff does work. Um, let's see here from Andrew. Heard you mention in one of your recent pimp casts that you were interested in learning more about the nat state national movement. I've been looking into it as well. One of the most comprehensive and understandable sources seems to be Brandon Joe Williams. And he sends me a link from YouTube. I'll have to check it out. I mean, what I'll, was the name again? Brandon Joe Williams. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to check that out. Um, so anyway, oh, this is one that's great, man. There's this guy, uh, Rusty. And he's showing his version of a chemtrail. <laughs> and he says, it says, believe in Jesus. And somebody did it with a, and they did it. Quite a fine job, man, with the aircraft. Wow. Yeah. yeah. You know how so many people, like, people write, um, I, I don't know what they use, but they write with the exhaust from a plane and stuff like that. They'll do pictures. I don't think or, it's an exhaust. I think they actually, they're putting something up there to spray it. Oh. Well, yeah, either not, way, that's cool. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. I thought that was really great. Um, let's see here. We also got one from Adam. I hope all is well. Here's some photos I've taken. Now, I'll tell you, this is from Adam, and folks, I'll do the best I can to describe this. He's basically taken uh, w uh, chicken netting, yeah, and he's cordoned off his garden area. And from what I can tell from it, I can't tell the whole thing exactly. I'll try to get it to where you can see it over here. That's cool. But basically, he's got his chickens in one portion of the garden over here where it oh, seems wow. to be doubled up on itself, I, and that's it up close. I've never seen anything like this, and if this thing functions the way I think it does... I That's think cool. it is absolutely a magnificent system. And basically, it looks like he's basically wrapped a portion of it. Can you describe it? It looks like he might be doing, like if you Google um, the, the Chuk Dome uh, system, where there's like 12 areas in the purple, dome moon. Purple pear. Yeah. If you, it, it looks like he might His be doing that it, on yeah. a rectangle, a uh, rectangular system instead of like the circular Chuk Dome system. Yeah, I thought it was That's fantastic. Cool. Yeah, so I was like, oh, goodness. So he's basically got them in this long rectangle, and he, it seems like it just makes its way through the garden, and I'm like... And, and that's what he's doing. That's genius. The chicken rectangle is a smaller rectangle within the garden rectangle. Yeah. And it seems to be working over a portion right. until it's ready for them to move into the next one. Uh, Ken says, I'm getting ready to plant comfrey. What type of soil do you recommend, son? Will it work in clay or does it need some other type of soil? It'll work in clay. We have it growing in almost Play-Doh down in Texas. Um, but it works. It does best if you're looking for roots, um, like to harvest roots. It does best in sandy soil. But if uh, it will grow in any kind of soil, yeah, it, in except clay, it's for just, a miracle grow, yeah, don't don't, plant it there. I've even seen it grow in there, but don't do it. It does well in some of your lousy soil. Mm -hmm. You're gonna need to water it when you put it in, so don't stick it in and not water it. But anyway, um, 
Somebody else is asking about, uh, oh, good night, man. Another one on um, bone sauce. I want to talk about this because they're asking, will it repel squirrels and rabbits, and what's the mix ratio per gallon? Okay, let me stop you right there. Um, <laughs> we've heard, I've never personally tried it on squirrels, um, and I know it works well on rabbits. I've heard people say that it works really well on squirrels, but I haven't done that. Now, as far as mixing this stuff, that is not what you want to do. We've had ladies in the past that have, uh, not ladies, there was one lady in particular Said she stuck it in the gallon jugs, squir- you know, swished it around and yeah. threw it out in the yard. And I'm like, what? No, that's not how you do this, y'all. This is an oil. It's, when I say oil base, it's a fat based. It's a very lipid based kind of thing. So if you are going to cut it, you can do it up to 50% with some sort of, sort of animal fat, particularly beef tallow. That works. Um, I don't like to cut it with anything. I like it strong. And this stuff is very, very, very strong with the methods we use. So, um, yeah, you're not going to, this ain't your mom and dad's bone sauce. I can promise you that. (laughs) Um, and then somebody else asking, you know, basically, uh, when to use it, how much do I need for 80 trees and how often do you apply it? Well, those are, it's kind of a loaded question because I don't know how big the trees are. If they're saplings, you could use a jar and hit them all. It's best to do it when the trees are dormant, but you can do it when they're not just go up to about five feet height, you know, browsing height and then hit the trunk. Hit whatever limbs are relevant, and uh, that's pretty much what you want to do there. As far as how many you're going to need, like I said, it all depends on the girth of that tree. And as far as how often you need to apply it, well, the stuff that we initially applied when we got here, I have not reapplied in two years. And it's supposed to, uh, apparently it lasts from 25 to 30 years. Yeah. Yeah, If you apply it to a wooden surface. Right. It can last that long. Um, You know, if they give me any more pressure, then yeah, I'll definitely be back for that. Um, burning on your site. Okay. Now here's one. I definitely want to cover son. Maybe you want to hit this also. Um, Billy, I need some advice. I'm trying to imitate your food forest and the area was consumed with trees, underbrush and vines. I cleared it all and burned the pile in place. I've collected the biochar from my animals, but I'm wondering if the ash left on the ground is going to negatively affect the growth of the trees, um, that I put in its place in its area. Okay. Possibly likely, um, two reasons, but also the, the terra preta. It depends on how big Not the brush terra pile. Not terra preta, terracotta. Yeah, terracotta. It depends on how big the brush pile was, how long it burned, and how hot it got. That's exactly what I wrote back to him is that, number one, yeah, you may have turned that into terracotta depending on the intensity of that fire and depending on how much clay you have in your soil. Right. So that's number one. Number two, well, you're going to have a pH problem, too, if you left, depending on how much you burned. I mean. Yeah, and also keep in mind that the varieties that come after a burn are typically high in cyanide, like they're phosphorus fixing plants. Um, and those typically are high in cyanide and that's to stop grazing animals from grazing those plants. And so it can like heal the soil. Yeah. You're going to need some time on that. Um, you might be able to plant some ferns. I mean, you might be able to choose the cyanide loving plants you or creating plants you want, or it may not be bad at all. You may just have a pH problem, but depending yeah. on the intensity of that fire, because, and it's funny you mentioned that because there are some controlled burns that I got to do around here. One in the gull- gully on the side of the house, which I'm going to have to be very strategic about another being our burn pile down by the rock in the middle of the pasture. Yeah, that'll be less consequential because it's yeah. mostly on that rock. Right, because we're burning on a doggone rock. Yeah. So that we want to be really, really careful careful of. So be really, really cautious with your burning. You want to make absolutely positively sure that, yeah, so terracotta and pH, you're going to have some problems. Could you, you, I wonder if like uh, putting down cardboard and wood chips over that would help i wondered and i don't know because i've never actually done it theoretically that's kind of what i was thinking yeah i was like um i wonder if you could throw a bunch of carbon out there i don't know because i've never had to do that not in that particular circumstances but that that's kind of where my mind is going all right y'all thank you so much for checking us out look we look forward to hearing from all of you in some way or shape or form in the future thank you so much until next time stay alert stay alive